Oh my goodness. You are such an inspiration. Wow, you really You're are. You're so strong. Can I pet your service dog? Ugh. One, two, three, let's go. We are artists, parents, teachers, good guys, bad guys, students, leaders. I'm not your inspiration. Yeah, I'm fully who I am. Got my own expectations that don't fit into your plans. I'm not your sad story, so I wrote it in this song. Everything you know about disability is wrong. Yeah, everything you know. Yeah, everything you know about disability is wrong. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Everything You Know About Disability is Wrong. Today on the podcast, we have model, actor, content creator, disability advocate, and CEO of Live Solo. Welcome to the show, Lolo Spencer. You might know Lauren Lolo Spencer from her role as Jocelyn on Mindy Kaling's Mac series, The Sex Lives of College Girls, or from her Indie Spirit Award nominated performance in the film Give Me Liberty. Her latest film, Bob Trevino Likes It, won this year's Narrative Feature Jury Award and Audience Award at the South by Southwest Film Festival. One of InStyle's 50 women making the world a better place, Lolo is an ambulatory wheelchair user due to a neuromuscular mobility disability. Last year, she launched Live Solo, a lifestyle brand dedicated to young adults with disabilities who seek independence and self-empowerment. Welcome to the pod, Lolo. Thank you, y'all. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> we are so excited to have you. Before we get started, let's do audio descriptions. So okay. I'll lead us off and then Erin will give hers and then you can give yours. Perfect. This is Lily speaking. I am a white presenting woman in my mid twenties. I have mid length brown hair and green eyes. Today I am wearing a black turtleneck and a gray cardigan along with my necklace that I fidget with often during the recording. Erin, you want to go ahead? Yep, I'm Erin. I'm a white presenting woman with red hair and blue eyes. And I'm sitting in my wheelchair and I have a striped long sleeve shirt on. Yes, yeah, so I'm Lolo. This is Lolo. I'm a black woman with big silver hoop earrings, a black headband, curly brown hair, a red t-shirt, and a beautiful gap that is always showing when I smile. <laughs> I love that. Um, Welcome to the podcast. We are so excited to have you. This is going to be a great episode. Uh, listeners, we always do a little pre-production call with our guests. And with Lola, we were just geeking and having a great time. So I know yes, this is going to be a great episode. Um, all right, let's let's get into it. Let's do the let's do the interview. Let's do yeah. it. <laughs> so um, we need to ask this question to all the guests. Um, since the name and our podcast is what it is. Um, we want to know what do people get wrong about you and your disability? Oh, that's a great question. Um, what do people get wrong about me and my disability? I think for me, because I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user, a lot of people assume that I'm permanently using my wheelchair because um, a lot of people don't know that you can still have ambulatory movement for those who don't know what that means. It basically means you're like able to walk and stand still. Um, a lot of people don't know that that exists. Um, so I think that's one of the, the main things about my disability that people get wrong. Um, and I would just say like, maybe overall, just this idea of like, life was like an extremely tragic experience or the reason I became a disabled person was because of an, a tragic experience. Um, that wasn't necessarily my case. It was something that was very unexpected for sure. Like didn't see it coming from anywhere, but it wasn't the result of something like horrific that people tend to associate when it comes to people being diagnosed with disabilities, you know? Um, so I would probably say those are the two biggest things that people tend to get wrong. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that when you see like, 
there's always the people that are trying to spot like people who use wheelchairs like that person's leg moved they don't need to be in this wheelchair like yeah and it can turn really violent like i've heard of people who are ambulatory who have really experienced like extreme harassment just like people being mad disrespectful to them because again they're like what are you doing parking in the handicapped spot and it's just like whoa relax and also let's fix language but you know that's a whole other thing for another day but <laughs> Tr- truly but, yeah a whole, uh... go wild and it's just like relax like you're not the disability police <laughs> yeah and it is odd how much people want to self-designate themselves as the disability police it is yeah. a role people want to play which is yeah. weird it is so weird and it's just like and then they want to play it but then, like, won't talk to the manager if a place doesn't have, like, a ramp. It's like, so you want to, like, accuse people for faking or what you assume to be faking, which obviously people aren't faking, but it only stops there. Like, it only starts and stops there just so you can feel like you have a moral ground to stand on when you go home at night. And you could go tell your friends and family, this is what I did today. Here goes my gold star to mm-hmm. humanity. I cussed out somebody who needed the space, but I didn't know they needed the space. And like, you know what I mean? It's like, what the fuck is that? That is such a good point of the, like, if you have that energy, if you yeah. want to come at something, like, and yeah. be the disability police, yeah, go talk to places that are inaccessible. Like, yeah. that's yeah. how that energy should be used. I That's such a good way to put it because, like... Sure, if you've got the energy, I don't have the energy to re- yell at random people throughout the day. Literally, but if, no. if you've got it, do it at inaccessible spaces. Or <laughs> right. like, there's just, yeah, there's no need to try to police what no one's like the, the trope of like faking a disability, like yeah. that comes from stereotypes from old movies. Like, there's exactly. no one's really doing that. Like, there's not a real. The benefits aren't good enough. I wish the benefits were good enough. <laughs> I wish the government gave us unlimited money and there were ramps everywhere. And right. Then it would make space. sense why people would like want to fake it. But like, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the case. Uh, those exactly. are great things that people get wrong. And of course, the the tragic backstory. People definitely, right. I think that's an assumption that from having a like neurological developmental disability like that people bring that to all aspects of disability just like oh what yeah. happened like you yeah thing or yeah i'm so sorry that i'm so sorry you are who you are <laughs> i'm like well yeah, I'm no, literally i went to the ear nose and throat doctor super random um and listen allergies and sinuses have really been a thing for me lately i don't know if it's my age what's happening but i went to the ear nose and throat doctor and the main entrance was not accessible was not given a heads up about it I mean because granted I guess I didn't say it but at the same time it's like should I have to Anywho, it wasn't accessible in the front so one of the nurses had to come downstairs to lead me to some other back way to you know get up to the doctor's office and as we're in the elevator she's just like oh no what happened you're too young and I'm like I want to scream. Like, she was like, you're, you're too young. What, what happened? And I'm like, I was like, nothing happened. Nothing happened. <laughs> I just was like, nothing happened. <laughs> just, I was like, there's no. And then just this idea of you're too young, right? Like, what is this ageism association with disability where it's like, It's expected if you're old to have a disability, but if you're young with a disability, again, your life is already like fucked. And it's just like, so many things happen and so many people at so many different ages. It's like, what is that about? I just thought that was, that was very- No, yeah, it, it is interesting because at the same time that that exists where like, oh, you're too young to be experiencing what you're going through. Then when people do accept disability, I feel like there's also the other side of ageism of like infantilizing, like assuming that you're like, Aaron, people always assume you're so young. Yes. Like a child. Yeah. And I just turned 40 uh, in August. Hi. Shut up. 
I remember one time, uh, I don't know if I already shared this story, but one time, me and my dad went to a, um, haunted house mm-hmm. in South Carolina, and, um, at the time, I was 25, maybe, and we got to get the tickets to get in, and the lady says to my dad, she has to be at least eight years old to get in. And I was like, uh, I'm older than you. <laughs> like, Yikes. Yeah. That's so wild. So, it, you know, you're getting it on both sides. The like, you're too, too young for this to happen. But then <laughs> once people they, accept it, then it's like, oh, let me treat you like a child. It's like, okay, which, which one y'all want us to be? Yeah. You want us to be the age that we actually are or not? Like, just what's the tea? Yeah. yeah it's so wild. weird. It's, it's so weird. And then plus it's like this, it didn't make me feel good either because it was just like, you're trying to make the fact that I'm younger than you expect me to have a disability. So like, almost like my youth is being attacked or something, or like my youth, like it just did it just the way she said, you're too young. I'm just like, fuck okay like you know what i mean like thanks for reminding me like what the fuck are you saying to me like what what is it was just so uncomfortable i just did not like it at all i was not yeah yeah Yeah, that's i'm sorry you dealt with that because there is like an underlying like the time of your life to have fun is yes exactly that lily like it was exactly like like you should be fucking and out and like doing all of these things like you should be all of these things you're too young you're too young and it's just like who's saying i'm not doing any of those things though like what yeah i'm out <laughs> like, yeah, i'm out i'm out here like girl i showed up to this appointment by myself like <laughs> yeah. and, and you see the way that i'm dressed like that's like all tino shade but like you see that i'm not like you see i have a good energy and a good spirit with me today like what about my it's just i don't girl okay i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i could go on this tangent forever clearly so yes i'm sorry (laughs) tangents welcome that's what this space is for because sometimes that's the only way we can get through just like blatant ableism it's just to have a space like this where we could be like what the fuck yeah literally (laughs) literally that but on to other topics um yes. kind of similarly adjacent though in january you made a video with one of our past guests and icon amazing woman jillian mercado oh, yeah. highlighting <laughs> your experiences as disabled actresses in hollywood yeah what has the response been to that video i saw it went pretty viral and oh, also how yes. much how much fun did you and jillian have making it because oh she's a first blast. of all when Jillian and I get together, it is a time, okay? <laughs> Jillian and I have so much fun. We are forever, like, kicking on the phone, just having a blast. That is my girl. And, you know, the the interesting part about us doing that video together, you know, it was during a time we both needed laughter. And so it was so special because we leaned on each other to do something we love to do, which is, you know, act and be funny and, you know, uh, and, and be together in friendship during a time we both really needed that kind of like emotional support. So it was a really fun video. Um, we totally enjoyed ourselves. Like we like even leading up to the video, we're like, leaving voice notes to each other. And we had like this uh, collaborative note on our phone of like all the ideas and and the the different things that we were gonna hit on in the video. And it was great. It was honestly just great. And so as far as the response, a lot of people really caught the humor that we were creating in the video. Like people understood what we were saying as far as like the seriousness of like, that's fucked up. Like these are the things that they've had to experience, but because it was done through laughter, I think people really were able to 
hone in on the fact that we made light of these situations and these experiences that we had without it being this raw, 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 like activist moment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, And so, yeah, like it really, and I think that's what made people really enjoy it. Uh, You know, disabled, non-disabled alike. And I enjoyed it. I want to do more things like her and I have talked about, like, girl, we should do like another video or something. I don't know what we would do, but, you know, um, we just, we just knew it was a good time and something special. So, um, and luckily everybody enjoyed it and everybody understood the joke. So it was great. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. Um, so, like, I know in our um, pre-production call, we talked a bit about, like, your time in Hollywood mm-hmm. and how a lot of people assume that you had some kind of, like, tragic, difficult time in yeah. Hollywood. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, when we talk about the entertainment industry in general, it is known fact of the abuse and manipulation and the harassment that people disabled, non-disabled have experienced in entertainment, right? So Hollywood just in general, I think already is known for its not so good parts of the industry (laughs) with all the documentaries that are coming out and the, you know, Me Too movements and all these different you know, celebrities going to jail for what they've done. You know, uh, people are already under that assumption that Hollywood is this scary, daunting place. And in many, many ways, it can be and has been for a lot of people. Um, For me in particular, I haven't had that experience. So I think it's important to also share what it looks like when cast, crew, your team all get on one page to be sure that you feel the most comfortable when showing up for work and what that looks like and what that means. Now, was there like some things that maybe could have been better? Sure, absolutely. Um, But was it anything that felt like it interfered with my ability to perform or show up for work. Nothing like that has ever happened for me. I mean, to be honest, the films that I was on, that I've been in have been independent budgets. So it's like, you kind of can gauge what your expectation is as far as like what you can get, right? But none of my disability accommodations were ever not met. Like those were always met, you know? Um, But it's like, is Crafty the best on an independent film? Probably not. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) But that has nothing to do with disability. That's just, you know, whatever, your own preference. Um, But I haven't had those experiences. And I think being able to share that that's the case is important so people know that they too can have a good experience living out their dream if this is what their dream is as well. Now, the thing is that I always like to be very clear about is it does not happen unless everybody is all in in making it happen. Mm -hmm. If one person is like, "Uh, I don't really think that's important, then the whole domino effect happens. But your team, your team, your manager, agent, assistant, whoever's on your team, those people and yourself have to be very, very clear and very specific about what your needs are on set. From the moment you are asked to leave your home to go to set and come back home, you better know what your checklist is and what that looks like and whatever those needs are. Secondly, the production has to be completely on board from the, if you're doing a TV show, from the showrunner down to the PA. 
everyone has to be on board and understand what we're asking for isn't a bougie request. What we're asking for is actual accommodations for us to be able to function while we're here and be as comfortable as possible or as relaxed as possible. So that way we can perform at the best of our ability, which is why you cast me to begin with. And I think when disabled talent knows that they got cast because of their talent, you go into it knowing that production wants you to play this role. Mm -hmm. So don't go into it, oh, I'm just happy to be here. I'll do whatever you guys need me to do. Oh, I'm not gonna ask because I don't wanna rock the boat. Fuck that. They wanted you. So ask for what you want in order to have the best experience that you can have while on set. That is such phenomenal advice for people pursuing who want to be on sets. And also just, I think in general, you know, whatever your workplace is, like self-advocacy is really important. And then also your management's advocacy is really important and having everyone on board. I, that what you were saying made me curious as because you have auditioned for both roles that have specified this is for a character with a disability and roles that have not and I, do you do you ever think about like when you're auditioning for those roles that have not specified like do you think self-advocacy might be more difficult on those sets because they didn't know disability was going to be a part of their set like I, I'm just interested in that experience that's actually a very good question. Um, for everything that I've booked so far, it has called for a disability. So I can't, I can't really say what the difference would necessarily be if they did choose me, yet the character itself didn't call for a disability. I don't mm -hmm. know. However, my team and I have booked me maybe if not for like an acting role it was for a modeling job or a speaker's you know to go speak somewhere be on a panel somewhere so we're used to me going to places that aren't disability focused mm -hmm. and yet still having to ask for the accommodation for what I need in order to show up and you know be there for what they want me to be there for. So we're used to it. So regardless, like if, if I were or when I do book a role that didn't necessarily call for a disability, we'll already know what to ask for. So it's like, you know, how production will respond to that. I would hope it would be, you know, welcomed, but I would just think that it would be very, uh, not smart on their end right. to cast a person with a disability, then be surprised that they have accommodations that they're asking for. <laughs> like, you Absolutely. Know? And, you know, I like that you spoke that uh, if into existence and made it a when, because non-disabled actors take disabled actor roles all the time. So we do need to get to a point where disabled actors are getting hired for characters that don't necessarily specify, because that's how we'll get to a point where sets know that they have to be accessible all the time. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's so important too, because I've always, you know, advocated, right? At the end of the day, Hollywood is nothing but a dream place. Like it, a lot of these scripts are from people's fucking imaginations, right? Like this is half of the shit isn't even real life. So it's like, if we're all pretending at the end of the day, why not be able to accommodate people the way they need to be accommodated. You know, once I get a callback and there's non-disabled people at the same callback audition, then it's like, all right, everybody play whoever you want to play. I don't care. I'll let a non-disabled person play a disabled person because now I know I can play a role that doesn't necessarily call for a disability, you know? Um, and so when that equity is there for us, who cares? Everybody have at it. Like, what's a hobbit anyways? That doesn't even exist. Like, you know what I mean? But there are roles for people, so. Yeah, you know, I wish people understood that, that, like, once we achieve equity, then you can do whatever you want. Like, you, it, then, 
then it's fine because we can, you know, and this applies to like trans actors and queer mm-hmm. actors in general. Like just how do we, yeah, it's just a equity makes it better for everyone. <laughs> exactly. Because there's plenty of gay actors, queer actors who play straight. Mm-hmm. And there's plenty of straight actors who have played queer. So it's like everybody's getting able is able to do it. Come on now. Disability, we're usually unfortunately at the tail end of getting what we need. But if we can get it, my theory is is if it can start showing up in entertainment, it will shift the way the rest of the world views our community and i hate to rely on entertainment to do it but honestly entertainment shifts culture and creates change it just is what it is absolutely and that goes to you know what you're saying about the video you made with jillian the fact that the the point was made so much better to your audiences because they're laughing they're enjoying it like tv and film is always going to have that ability to like we're already pretending we're already suspending disbelief so that puts you in like an open state of like well i didn't realize the world is bigger than i expected i think that's really great and exactly and you know i'm so glad you've had great experiences on set and haven't had the again the tragic backstory that's assumed (laughs) for so many people so you're currently filming the new season of sex lives of college girls right Yes, yes. What has been, do you have like a favorite onset experience from filming? Um, not one that I can talk about necessarily. I will, say, <laughs> I, I will say the one thing that I was really excited about this season is, so it's notoriously known that there are no wheelchair accessible trailers except this one trailer that exists that isn't even like as comparable but is like cute enough you know to get through your day um that trailer was at base camp this time and for those who don't know base camp is the area on every production where where everyone kind of riles up together cast crew everyone is there that's like when you can't find somebody like you start at base camp like, well, if you're looking for somebody, you start at base camp, see if they're at base camp. And then if they're not, then they better be on set. Because if they're not on set, then it's like, well, where the hell did this person go? So, <laughs> <laughs> so base camp is like the place where everybody hangs out. Um, so my trailer is on base camp this season. So I was really, really excited about that. Because previous seasons, I was in an accessible room that was a little further away from base camp. Um, which was great in the sense of the fact that the room was so big. So I did enjoy that, like the space. It feels good to be, to have my trailer at base camp because now I can yell at my castmates out the window and be like, hey girl, like, you know, (laughs) we can just have us a good little time, keep the, the trailer doors open, play some music. Just enjoy ourselves, you know, yell out to somebody, be like, can I get a donut from Crafty? Like, you know, and just just chill with each other and, you know, go to the Starbucks that's on, on, on the lot or something like that. You know, it's, yeah, that's, it's, that's a fun cast. You want to be able yeah. to be a part of that camaraderie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exactly. Cool. Exactly. That's amazing. If I was on set, I'd be like, I need Starbucks right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. No, um, there was one time we were waiting, um, to go on set, which is, you know, a normal thing to do. And I was like, yo, I want Starbucks. And so uh, me and my friend who uh, helps with, he's basically my aide right now. um, We were like, yo, let's try and find the Starbucks. And so one of the PAs overheard us and was like, oh, you want me to walk you to Starbucks? Like, yeah, walk us to Starbucks. And then one of my other castmates was just like, chilling outside of her trailer and she was like oh i want to go to starbucks i'm like girl come on and so we all just went and got starbucks because we were on board waiting for us to get called so <laughs> yeah it was great um so we're gonna pivot a little bit to chat about uh live solo yes can you tell us uh how you started that what was your your inspiration 
Yes. So Live Solo is my lifestyle brand dedicated to young adults with disabilities who are seeking independence and self-empowerment. And it was an idea that I had always been like playing around with for a while, but really didn't put into action until 2020 COVID when we had nothing but time to just sit and think. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So um, I was just recognizing that at the time I, you know, I had all this started because I had a YouTube channel, my YouTube channel sitting pretty. And I just had recognized like with sitting pretty, it was only my perspective, my experiences, my stories. And I felt like there should be a platform that expands disability beyond my own awareness um, and give those people the opportunity because not everyone is necessarily comfortable in front of being in front of a camera and like talking to a screen or whatever. Um, So I was like, what can I do that would allow people to create more community? So I thought about this lifestyle brand and listen, I have a whole five year, 10 year like idea for it. And so it started off as an online blog first and I was able to gather a bunch of people who wanted to write for Live Solo and share their experiences and what they've gone through with their particular disabilities. But the point of it was to be able to provide solutions around lifestyle experiences, right? I feel like with disability, there's so much out there for our medical needs, but not enough about our lifestyle needs. You know, how do we dress? Where do we go to have fun? How do we travel? What are the ways to go navigate restaurants or whatever the case is? Like, nobody's talking about it. And so I wanted to provide an opportunity for that. So we got riders with um, severe food allergies, which I did not know classified as a disability, but definitely does. Um, Severe food allergies, ADHD, CP, EDS, um, blindness, um... I'm trying to think of everybody that's contributed. Uh, is somebody else part of that group? I can't remember. There's just so many people. <laughs> like, but the point is, is that it's beyond just my personal experience. So start off as an online blog and now has transitioned to a digital magazine, which I really love because now we can add imagery to the story that we didn't quite have the... Um, same opportunity to do in the form of an online blog. So that is available. All of the issues are on our website, livesolo.co. And yeah, it was, it's really dope. I'm really excited about it and, and where I plan to take it. Such, I just love what you said about sharing multiple perspectives. Like that's such a, it's so necessary. And like, yeah, we're so medicalized, but like we also have cute style to show off and like Weird. fun stuff. Like that's so great. And actually it transitions us so beautifully into the next section of this interview because we this is an Easter Seals podcast. So we like to talk about the Easter Seals pillars, which are um education, employment, transportation, community, and healthcare. And I always like to start with community because it's so necessary. And I mean you're doing it. You're building community there. That's yeah. sharing those stories and creating a place where people, I mean, even just reading that digital magazine like that, well, it it's it feels so good to be a part of something. And whether that's as a reader or someone who's creating their own material. So I think that's just so incredible what you're doing. And, you know, we've talked about it a little bit, but what, what kind of role do you think community plays in your life? And that what how did that inspire you to decide to do this? You know, community for me is everything, even in my personal life. Like I, I've lived in LA almost 20 years. Yes. Almost 20 years. And everywhere I've lived, I've built community around me. Like even right now, um, there was a time in my, uh, apartment where my best friend was living on the sixth floor. My really good friend, Wes Hamilton, I'm sure you guys know who he is. He was living on the fifth floor. Um, Currently, my sister lives in the building over. Like we just, it's always community. It's so many, uh, it's just so important to have. 
Um, and so I really wanted to be sure that I was able to create kind of the same experiences that I get to have on a personal level to the community of people with disabilities as well, because that's the one thing that I really know I'm good at is bringing people together. And I wanted to use that strength in a positive way and in a way that felt like it was serving people beyond who I know personally. So yeah, so I, so Live Solo is my thing and I can't wait till we expand into like in-person events and activities and that kind of thing because, because even during COVID I was hosting Zoom parties and it was lit. Like people were turning nice. up. So that's so cool that you, I mean, you're a community builder. That's such yeah. a like incredible skill to have. And, yeah. and like, when you have a good community builder in your life, it's so, in one of my best friends is a therapist and just is a phenomenal community builder. And yeah. like, I feel so lucky to have her in my life because the way she brings people together, it sounds mm -hmm. to me like you're very similar to her in that just like some people have a skill of bringing people from different communities together and creating a bigger community. Like yeah. that is a skill, like really yeah. amazing. And I think about, you know, the start of this interview, you talking about you and Jillian making that video right when you really needed it. And like yeah. having someone who just gets it, like that, that aspect of community cannot be valued high enough. I mean, that's exactly. why we made this podcast was to have a place yeah. where we can just talk to people who get it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's, it's such a, uh, beautiful experience to have when you do have community. And I know a lot of times disability can feel very isolating um, in our experiences, um, in what we're feeling and what we're going through. So I want to ultimately have Live Solo be a place where people don't, even if they might be isolated in real life for whatever reason, there's somewhere online that they can feel community and like I said, when we get to the point of doing stuff in person, like there's somewhere for them to go where people get it. Because a lot of times our family, our friends, they don't get it. And it's not their fault for not getting it because nobody's ever educated on disability the way that we're educated on so many other things. But because they're not educated in it, it's hard to feel fully connected in a lot of ways. So when you are around people who get it, it makes all the difference. Totally. And I think like communities help a lot with mental health as well. Wonderful. Yeah. And speaking about health, um, have, have you been, how has your experience in healthcare, do you find it like accessible? I'm sure there's a lot of stories you can share. <laughs> Any tell from my facial uh, responses? <laughs> <sighs> How do I say this in a way that feels? I don't know. Um, the healthcare system, I think specifically in the States, I mean, obviously because I haven't needed care outside of the States. Um, the more you learn about it, the more detrimental it feels when you have a medical condition mm -hmm. because of the proven stuff that has come out about big pharma and that it being all about money and not really wanting to heal or care for people. Um, and in my case, not only because I have a disability, but I'm also a black woman, which mm -hmm. statistics have shown that our pain is not revered as serious as when it's a white woman's pain. And a lot of us get misdiagnosed with things, uh, because no one wants to take the time out to care for us. And... I had a recent experience 
uh, cause I'm going through the process of figuring out what my true diagnosis is again, um, which has unraveled a lot of emotions, <laughs> a lot of emotions, a lot of mental things that I have to do to keep my mental health straight. Um, and the doctor was just very dismissive. It was very like, um, there's no motivation to truly figure something out. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that frustrates me about the healthcare system. And it's this constant extreme challenge to get services that we need to where it's like, how is it that a doctor's note isn't enough? But we also have to prove how much money we have in our bank or uh, get four different types of doctor's notes. And it's just this constant, okay, you got something wrong. Here goes a pill. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait a minute. Before you throw this at me, are we sure this is what's really going on? Because again, again, it's it's just pure dismissiveness. So I'm not the biggest fan of the healthcare system. Um, it shouldn't be, it should not take fucking weeks to get our wheelchairs fixed for those who are wheelchair users. I specifically remember one time my wheelchair broke and I, you know, the wheelchair repair man came to my house and, you know, he was just like, how did your wheelchair break? And I was just like, to be completely honest, I don't know. You know, I have my nine to five job. I'm taking the bus, you know, maybe I like hit a curb too hard or something like that. Like, I don't know just what it is. And he was just like, wait, you take your wheelchair outside every day. And I said, yes, so I have to get to work. And he was like, oh, that's probably why your wheelchair keeps breaking down. I was like, I'm not, I'm not understanding. And he was like, well, wheelchairs aren't designed to go outside. And I was like, what, what? So he was like, so technically you're using your wheelchair way more than it's designed to actually handle. And I'm like, what? What? And I'm like, so these devices from inception are being designed for us to not have a life outside of our front doors. Who came up with that? Who's yeah. telling people to do this? Mm -hmm. Why? Literally, what the fuck and why? Like, and that's when I knew like, oh, this shit is fucked from like inception. We've got to do something to change this. <laughs> like, so, and then it took weeks for the chair to even get fixed. I had to get a rental. That cost so much money to get the rental for as long as it took for me to get the wood. It was just, and then you got to get a referral from the doctor for fucking what? Why does the doctor have to say she needs her chair fixed? Just let me get my chair fixed. It's broken, period. In a discussion. Like, you don't need to fucking get a mechanic to sign off on you getting an oil change. You just go get your oil changed. I, I, I try not to get upset about the healthcare system, but it's that I really wish alternative medicine was more welcomed um, in this country as a primary form of care that is covered by insurance. However, it's not. So that's a whole other tangent for another day. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's really hard. And I mean, working at Easter Seals, that's something that a lot of people who are participants talk about, like just inability to find the equipment they need. And, you know, Easter Seals is just one nonprofit. They can't, we're doing the best we can, but it's, it's yeah. ridiculous how many people are really not given the supplies they need to thrive. And, you know, you know hearing you say that, and sometimes when given are then told that, well, it's actually not designed for you to leave your house, which what, what the heck is that? Like, oh, it's not designed for you to live your life. That's ridiculous. Literally, literally. 
And also wanted to say so heard on the like mental gymnastics of trying to keep yourself feeling okay while figuring out a diagnosis. I, I mean, mixed race person getting an autism diagnosis was ridiculously impossible because yeah. every time I go into the doctor, my whole childhood, it was just like, well, try this antidepressant, try this thing, try this. And now looking back, you know, I look at my whole childhood and it's like, it was really, really obvious, actually. Like, I'm not even that high masking. Like, it was <laughs> right. really, really obvious right. if anyone had taken more than 30 seconds. Like, and now exactly. I'm in the process of getting an EDS diagnosis. And I'm like, mm. I have an appointment that I'm really excited for. But also, yeah. deep down, I'm like really scared because I know yeah. how often those appointments end in like walking in, being dismissed by often like, an older white man who was never related to anything I've ever done and like just just ridiculous how like you know you're going to get a diagnosis which is already its own like feet to climb and yeah. then to have to deal with bigotry in there it's just ridiculous yes. and it is um a real shame and I I do hope that I mean, we don't have to solve the problem on this podcast, luckily, but I, yeah. if I'm going to suggest a, a solution, would hope it would be that we need more disabled doctors. And that begins with yeah. med schools being better about um, acceptance mm -hmm. rates and being accessible. Uh, my yeah. older sister is a doctor and she's phenomenal and has worked really hard to um, take my experience as her disabled younger sister and become a better doctor in that. Yeah. And she's fighting against systems and it's really hard. And when yeah. we talk about her experience in medical school, she'll often bring up that like, she was asked to do things that were not healthy. And so if yeah. someone can't necessarily like the staying up for 48 hours for crazy rotations or for wild rotations and like we, medical school has got to change to be accommodating because we, this country so desperately needs disabled healthcare workers. There's no, there's no amount of education for non-disabled people in my mind, at least that will replace just having a healthcare system that employs disabled people because a disabled doctor is going to understand us better than any, any non-disabled person who's educated. 100%. And I think when the healthcare system changes its motivation from money to actually getting to the root cause of something and being open to new ways of figuring that out outside of the textbook boxes that they've learned. I think we would all be, I think if alternative medical practitioners were able to work hand in hand with traditional medical practitioners and someone be like, God, I can't, I can't figure this out. Maybe I need to send you to this holistic practitioner and have them look at you. I think we would all be in a much healthier, healthier state because the things that I've learned now, I'm really about to go on a tangent. The things that I've learned about certain alternative medicines, a lot of people are not privy to like, have you guys ever heard of grounding or earthing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Blew my mind. My dad, oh, what is that? my dad taught me about this. So basically, and when you guys Google it, look it up, I promise you. They basically said that there's these like doctors who learned about this. If you have any form of like chronic pain or chronic inflammation, a lot of our diseases that people are experiencing um, from, you know, rheumatoid arthritis to uh, chronic pain to menstrual cramps, whatever it is. It's all rooted in inflammation. So they say, if you put your bare feet in the grass or on the ground in the sand, anywhere where it's natural stuff happening from the earth for a minimum 30 minutes every day, your inflammation will drop drastically. Pain will drop drastically. Like it's been proven. And I think about people with disabilities all the time. And I haven't really been the one that like super advocates for this because I'm still learning, right? So let me preface this to say, I'm still learning this. So please. But 
knowing that you could put your feet in the grass for 30 minutes every day and it being able to change your inflammation in your body is fascinating. It literally has helped me with my insomnia that I was suffering from a few months ago. Literally, I was able to start going to sleep way more peacefully. Now I can sleep without medication. And so it's fascinating when you learn about these things and it's not talked about. You don't go to a doctor's office and, and, and or even just something as simple as changing your diet to being vegan and how much changing your diet has helped people fight cancer without chemo has helped people. Now I'm not saying like the medical system doesn't have a place because it definitely has a place. Like I'm totally for taking medications if you really, really need it. But have we explored other things, you know? Um, and so I just highly recommend everybody just look into it because it's completely free to put your feet in the grass. That's all. It's, it's interesting because it kind of ties back into community in that like information sharing kind of a yeah. way because yeah. When we live, you know, when you think about like people before, like, I don't know what the before is, but when people lived in tighter communities where you could have these conversations and like about what in your environment is causing problems and what we're seeing like in your neighborhood able to do, mm -hmm. I think it's really important because like, yeah, whether it's grounding or like the thing that I keep thinking of is that I tried that. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but the TikTok trend about tart cherry juice, which was about drinking you know. tart cherry juice before bed, apparently is like really helpful for winding down. And um, it's the, the way I saw it on TikTok was talking about like people who don't do very well with melatonin and I don't do mm. well with melatonin. It makes me feel terrible. Mm. Um, so I, but I have a hard time falling asleep and it, you know, if I'll be honest, when I saw the tart cherry juice thing, I was like, this is a TikTok trend. It's placebo. Like, this is not going to work. Yeah. And one of my friends tried it and was like, hey, like, I want you to actually try this. And I I swear by it now. And I've gotten like four nice. or five other friends on it because it has really helped my nice. sleep. And it's like, you know, I don't need to necessarily go like rewrite the textbooks. Right. <laughs> to right. Reduce is the answer. But at the right. same time, like, it's, you know, we, we have and all full circle brings us to like, your brand live solo having like a digital magazine having these methods where especially disabled people can share our information with each yes. other i think is yeah. so important and you know we've seen on tiktok how many people i mean the autistic community how many yeah. people were struggling through a million diagnoses but couldn't figure out why none of these medications made them feel better and then in 2020 when we're all locked inside our homes start talking about like, hey, I actually am autistic. I found this out. And then suddenly we've got all these people self-diagnosing, which I, I know that there are people who are like self-diagnosis is the worst, but I'm a huge fan. I think it's really important. We, yeah. when you can find things out in community and figure out like, hey, like I've, my experiences are coming from other people's li lived experience. I think that's really how we like heal together and how we create Absolutely. what you're talking about these medical practices that aren't just a 20 minute appointment in a cold sterile room where Girl. we're not looking at any of the external factors that have affected a person exactly exactly one hundred thousand percent and even you bringing up uh you about to go through an eds diagnosis for the may issue of live solo one of our writers talks about her journey um, with her mother, getting her mother an EDS diagnosis from a physician who also has EDS. Wow. So you got to check that one out. <laughs> I will for sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. When things are done by and for within the community, it's so incredible. Yeah. We Last season we had Kaylin Partlow, who is an autistic content creator, who also is an autism therapist. And it's like, oh man, an autistic person doing autism therapy, a person with EDS diagnosing EDS. Like yes. this is, this is the money. This is where <laughs> it's at. Like, yeah. And you know, I think, I do think we're on a path. Like we're, we're yeah. getting closer. I we're, agree. Even the fact that we have space like this to like have conversations like this, I think is important. And 
I, I do feel that in, you know, whether it's in my lifetime or not, we're going to have a world that is a lot more inclusive because Absolutely. when we have disabled doctors and a world where disabled people can get around easily without worrying about their wheelchairs being broken on a plane, yes. Like, yes. the world will Hello. be better. Exactly that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly that. Like, think of how much information the world is missing out on because of yes. inaccessibility. Because disabled people are smart and we are innovators. innovators because we have to yes. be. We have to be. And and I don't even think the inaccessibility is more the issue. It's the attitude around disability that ultimately ends up being the issue as to why people aren't open to learning or open to discovering or uh, investigating about new ways of doing things or new ways to design something. It's because a lot of people are very scared to to be introduced to disability because of the stereotypes that have been surrounded around the community in general. So ultimately, inaccessibility is one thing too, but I think ultimately the attitude around being involved or inclusive to people with disabilities is the thing that needs to change the most. I think that's super correct and just like you know goes with the thesis of why we made this podcast and yes i think I from, from the work you're doing as an actress in you know changing representation on screen not only as a disabled woman but as a black disabled woman you are breaking down barriers of uh representation on screen so the work you're doing yeah as an actress, the work you're doing as the creator and founder of this brand, like it's people like you that are going to change those attitudes. And um, I am so grateful you came on this podcast. This has been such a wonderful episode recording. Yes. Um, I had a blast. Anything before we close? No, I just, I love having you on. Thank you. And I hope that we stay in touch because I had a great time, and I really appreciate the work that you've done. I've been following you since you've been on your YouTube channel. Oh, so yay! Been, so I'm so happy that you're here. Yes! Thank you. Thank you so much. And you know what I would love to do? I would love to ask one of my writers to interview y'all, and we do, like, a feature in Live Solo about the podcast. We'd love to yeah. do that. Wouldn't that That'd be, be incredible? That would okay. be so amazing. And we love a collaboration. And we love a collaboration. Like, <laughs> and we, Lola, we're so, as Easter Seals representatives, we're so appreciative of all of the work you do to help us make our mission come true. Uh, Lola yeah. has participated in things with our affiliate at Easter Seals Southern California. And just overall, your advocacy knows no bounds and we are so excited to have you in our community because as we said community is everything that's it that's it thank you y'all so much this was a blast i had a great time <laughs> and listeners we will see you next time for another episode of everything you know about disability is wrong if you like what you heard go ahead and subscribe and leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you to our listeners. And as always, thank you to Easter Seals for giving us the space and resources to share such authentic conversations from within the disability community to our listeners. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Everything You Know About Disability Is Wrong. Everything you know about disability is wrong. This is a podcast brought to you by Easter Seals. You know, we actually work for Easter Seals, but maybe our listeners don't know what we do. That's true. Easter Seals is leading the way to full access, equity, and inclusion for disabled people and their families. And did you know we've been doing this for more than a century? This includes helping disabled people find meaningful employment, and addressing health care needs for all ages. We're proud to serve communities across the country and ready for the next 100 years. For more, check out EasterSeals.com.